I know I got the signal that we can get our panelists online. Tatiana Palermo, założycielka i prezes Palermo Strategic Consulting LLC. Uh, hello, uh, Tatiana, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Alicia Hernandez, Radca do Spraw Rolnych, uh, um, uh, Ambassador of USA in Warsaw. Can you hear me, Alicia? Good morning. No, we can hear you. Try We can't hear you, Alicia. Okay, we'll check it in a moment. We'll check in a moment. We're working on that. And Francis uh, Dorsmain, Councillor and Senior Trade Commissioner at the Embassy of Canada to Poland. Thank you for joining us uh, today, Francis. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, let's uh, start from the tricky question, I guess. And the first question is to you, Francis. The tricky question is like, Will non-EU countries follow the Green Deal agenda? <laughs> I think it, the, the question there about following uh, versus having our own our own agenda um, is, is more important there. Um, the EU is not operating in a vacuum. Uh, and, and Canadian policies, quite frankly, are, are very much aligned with the Green Deal. Um, all major economies right now are very conscious of the importance of addressing climate change. And we've been working together to address this um, over many years. And it's particularly important in the current situation uh, with the lead up to COP26 in, uh, in Glasgow in November. I mean, we've we've over the past year, despite COVID, we've put out a very aggressive uh, climate change um, uh, policy in Canada, uh, looking to aim to get to net zero in 2050 with aggressive 2030 targets as well. Um, and as part of that, uh, we've also got a uh, Canadian agri-environmental strategy, uh, which is coming into place, which will serve to guide investments uh, of approximately 185 million in funding for um, uh, natural climate solutions for agriculture. Um, so we're very much aligned. We work very closely with the European Union. Um, and so I think uh, for us, uh, we, we see the Green uh, green Deal as an opportunity uh, rather than a an, an barrier. Okay. I would like to ask the same question to uh, Alicia Hernandez because it's a very important question. Uh, will non-EU countries follow the green, uh, green agenda? Do you agree with Francis? Um, I agree with some of what Francis had to say, um, and I think some other parts, uh, similar to Canada, the United States has its own uh, pathways to having more sustainable agricultural production, both within the United States and for our trading partners around the world. We really do see climate change as a global problem, so it needs global solutions. Um, for us, one of the key parts is making sure our farmers are involved from the beginning in the strategies to how we get to more sustainable agricultural production. Um, we know, for example, we have climate hubs throughout the United States that are focused on different regions. So producers in those regions can help us and inform us and provide data that will make our agricultural production more sustainable. Um, again, just given the varied climates throughout our country, we know and that the people who live there and farm there every day can probably help inform us um, what are the best ways to get to more sustainable production. And then a key part of that is how we as the government can be a facilitator to share that information and invest in the technology and the research to get um, to lower the environmental footprint of the agricultural production of the United States. Yeah, and I, I, I must add that you are the voice of Brazil. Uh, uh, because I, 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 I was asking about the U.S. voice, and now Alicia, uh, Tatiana Palermo, excuse me, uh, it's, it's time for you. Uh, well, uh, Brazil, together with all the other nations, will have to embrace uh, the climate agenda. And the regulations related to the EU Green Deal will have an important impact on uh, EU trade with Brazil. The carbon border adjustment mechanism and the coming regulations, particularly the coming regulations that will require EU importers of beef, soy, coffee, cocoa, timber and palm oil to certify that these six commodities 
come from lands that have not been deforested or contributed to land degradation will require adjustments and creation of additional reporting and certification for the traded agricultural goods. With the need to establish effective traceability and certification mechanisms, the tendency is actually to further reduce trade flows uh, in the coming years, at least in the short term. Uh, the EU was once Brazil's major agricultural trade partner, and not anymore. Uh, Brazilian agricultural trade uh, has been shifting towards Ch China and Asia in general since China joined the World Trade Organization 20 years ago. Now almost 40% of all Brazilian agricultural products go to China and only 15% to the EU. And for some commodities, this, these numbers are even higher. More than 70% of all soybeans and 50% of all beef are sold to China. And uh, as the previous panelists uh, said, the, the major problem besides the new regulations is uh, actually uh, are tariff, uh, are high tariffs and non-tariff barriers, sanitary and phytosanitary barriers. Uh, the EU and Mercosur, which is the bloc that besides Brazil includes Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay, negotiated a free trade deal after almost 20 years of negotiations, uh, the, uh, the countries negotiated a free trade deal in 2019, but it still has to be signed and ratified by the parliaments. And this trade deal has a really good environmental chapter. So this trade deal could foster trade and introduce high environmental standards, which is beneficial for both for the EU and Brazil. But without the free trade deal, I think the trade will continue getting smaller. So this is the biggest challenge for the uh, agricultural trade. Great, thank you. Thank you for your point of view. And now let me switch into Polish just for a second. You can use the translation uh, because we have guests from, from Poland. Dariusz Szymczyka, Vice President of Polish Ukrainian uh, Chamber of Commerce. Poland and Ukraine, we've been cooperating uh, significantly. Uh, this is outside the EU, but you aspire to be the member of the EU country. This is also the area of uh, international conflict. So what is the situation in these circumstances? Ukraine uh, is now in a very special moment. They uh, Ukraine does not want to go to the east. <laughs> okay, of course, and that was a slip of tongue. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said west, but I meant east, of course. That was a slip of tongue. We would like to go to, to the west, definitely. But we have some problems. These problems re relate to the pace of uh, adjusting to uh, the requirements and the number of promises that we have from the west. There is no doubt that Ukraine is a country with significant uh, possibilities and very ambitious society, and Ukraine is focused in terms of uh, policy towards the West. In terms of economic, economics, we look at um, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, if we talk about food and agriculture, there is Qatar. So uh, there is no monopoly here, but we are trying to do our best. With Polish uh, Ukrainian Chamber of Com Commerce, you discuss the European Green Deal. What, what, how, how do you perceive this European Green Deal? Yes, we discuss this and we um, say uh, rather sad uh, and uh, it will not be uh, detrimental to our relations because this year, within nine months, uh, we reached uh, 
the same level of uh, trade from last year. So it means that uh, uh, the trade exchange between Poland and Ukraine uh, is uh, maintained at a very good level. This was around 40%. So this European green bean is going to uh, disturb uh, our relations, historically speaking. Uh, um, well, in 2014, the so-called green creatures. Uh, in 2014, we had a uh, downturn in uh, relations uh, between the Ukraine and the EU. So we were working for four years to reach the same level uh, as four years before. And the European Union helped us significantly because we have the association agreement, we have trade agreements with the EU supporting our trade relations. Uh, this is a very good comparison um, that the green creatures, uh, those of you who do not remember, I think that Vladimir Putin said it, that these uh, uh, green creatures were just the, the people that just bought the uh, green uniforms of the Russian army uh, during these uh, conflict situations. Uh, Francis, the first question is to you. Uh, how do non-EU companies view European strategic direction of, uh, on uh, sustainability? Um, I, I think it's the, they view it generally favorably. And this is in the conversations that that I've been having in terms of the the companies that I work with. Um, I mean, for for companies, they they look to assess the cost of doing business. Um, in specific markets, and they're going to adjust their business models. Um, I was speaking with a large Canadian investor here. They've got about 100,000 employees worldwide. Um, they've told me that they've received direction from their headquarters that they need to actually adjust to have a net zero footprint worldwide. Um, and so they're looking at sort of various ways to sort of increase sustainability within their own um, sort of footprint with their business. And so there's an adjustment that's happening, I think, on an individual company level, which is important to note. I mean, we've just recently had elections in Canada um, where um, they were on September 20th. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's government was uh, brought back into power um, uh, with a minority government as they, they were before. But what's interesting about this election is that this is the first election that we've seen where all major parties had climate change action as a key component of their platforms. And if you look at the voting results, so overwhelmingly uh, citizens in Canada, so um, you know, working for companies, owning companies, they voted in for in favor of climate action and uh, you know reducing carbon footprint for industry, for agriculture. And so for us in Canada, we see this as sort of a natural progression, and we work very closely with the European Union um, on sustainability issues. And so for, for us, um, through uh, mechanisms such as the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, or CETA, we're having this access. We have this discussion that's ongoing, and sustainability is a key part of CETA. Um, where we work very closely with the European Union to ensure that we're we're quite aligned on these topics. So individual companies, they're seeing it, they're costing it, they're adjusting their their business models. They're going to keep doing business, and and Europe as a whole, Poland as a country, is quite attractive. Um, and certainly, what we've seen is you know following the uh, the provisional application of CETA. We've seen a growth in trade of around 16% uh, year over year. 2020 and COVID, a bit of a blip, um, but companies are moving. And quite frankly, more Polish companies are taking advantage of CETA exporting into Canada now uh, than we were seeing before. So sustainability, it becomes a branding uh, and marketing point for these companies going into Canada. We're accessing a customer who's increasingly interested in not just value for money, but also the sustainability, how the product was sourced, um, it goes, it, it, to me, this is an opportunity. Yeah, really glad to hear that, really glad to hear that. But, you know, on the other hand, I am really wondering, curious, are sustainability aspects becoming a competitive advantage for economies? What do you think? <laughs> um, I mean, I wouldn't say this is not looking at it as a macro question, look at it as a micro. Um, so yes, as an economy, we become, we can position ourselves more competitively as being sustainable, as hitting sort of our, our climate change targets. 
Uh, but as a firm, absolutely. I mean, we saw movements of people looking for organic products, um, fair trade products, sustainability, net zero, um, and sort of reduced carbon footprint. Absolutely, this is a branding, this is a marketing point. Um, I served in China for a number of years, and the, the Chinese word uh, for crisis is two characters, one which is problem, one which is opportunity. And, and that's what I see here. Um, and that's also what I'm hearing from, uh, from companies is they see sustainability, they see um, sort of lowering their carbon footprint as an opportunity to position themselves competitively against uh, sort of companies coming from different markets. Yeah, thanks. And again, I think that that's the question uh, should be asked to, to consumers, <laughs> not companies also. Uh, okay, uh, Alicia, the question to you, what steps your country is taking towards as your carbon economy and food and agri uh, sector? Um, well, one of our priorities is to kind of leverage the programs and resources that we already have as USDA, but to kind of align them more towards sustainable production. So we actually have uh, USDA uh, offices in most counties throughout the United States, and those are working with farmers to help them understand the opportunities out there, how the government can support them um, to make their production more sustainable and to minimize the environmental footprint of doing so. Uh, we also do want to leverage, as I mentioned earlier, our climate hubs and also as USDA and the government encourage uh, more investment in research because um, we do think our ideas for how to produce sustain sustainably right now um, those will evolve over the years to make sure as we meet this climate crisis. So we do think the government should take a role in leading in the investment to better understand um, how we can be more sustainable. And another part of our approach is the data. We need to understand what's working and what's not. So we do help put people on the right path to, to lower their environmental footprint. Um, we think farmers and producers will be encouraged when they see the results of this, um, but they do also need to worry about um, just their economic viability. So we as the government wanna make sure they understand the benefits of producing more sustainably, uh, both for their own pocketbook uh, pocketbooks, but also uh, in terms of their production and where it can take them. So for us, it really is kind of uh, starting from the ground up, uh, making sure farmers are involved in this process and that we as the government can help guide them as they guide us into how we can be more sustainable as a country. Great. Data. You mentioned data. Data means uh, technologies. Technologies means for industrial revolution. Uh, but you also mentioned uh, helping industry, helping companies. What about people? What about knowledge and, you know, uh, finding for changing the people's mind and attitude? Yeah, well, we think that's definitely a part, right? Because, of course, farmers uh, produce to feed people. And if people aren't buying their products, they still won't produce the same way. So as we encourage farmers to be more sustainable, we do want consumers to be willing to go out there and pay that extra money um, to buy something that has a lower environmental footprint. Um, but that also means uh, making sure that consumers trust the information that they have. Um, can they see a difference in their experience? How do they know um, what labeling initiatives that they can trust and what do they understand? So we do think that falls on the government, but also on producers to help uh, and companies, food processing companies, et cetera, uh, to help inform consumers about what is a reliable standard uh, and what is a trustworthy standard? Because already we've seen uh, sometimes consumers saying that all the different initiatives and uh, voluntary labeling programs can be a little bit much for the average consumer to understand. Um, whereas those of us who work in this every day might have a better understanding of the differences. So we do think it kind of falls on everybody to because everyone plays a role in fighting against climate change to educate themselves about what the difference is between um, sustainable production and production that still has a ways to go to lower its environmental footprint. Great, great, glad to hear. Tatiana, uh, what do you think about it? Uh, uh, how will regulation related to the Green Deal affect uh, trade relation? I think, um, as I already said, uh, the trade relationship will be affected by the regulations related to the EU Green Deal, but Brazil is also uh, embracing uh, the climate agenda. President uh, Bolsonaro announced ambitious commitment, uh, commitments at the Leaders' Summit on Climate in April to end illegal deforestation by 2030 and to reach carbon emissions neutrality by 2050, the same date as the EU. 
Uh, at the same time, Brazil has yet to announce its uh, adjusted nationally determined contributions and allocate additional funding for the implementation of the environmental commitments. Brazil actually has one of the most rigorous environmental legislations in the world. Uh, around 66% of all the country is still covered uh, by native vegetation, including a certain portion of vegetation on agricultural lands that farmers have to preserve by law. Sometimes this portion comes to around 20% of all the farmers' lands. Uh, at the same time, in order to meet the announced climate targets, especially with regard to deforestation, the country will need to improve enforcement and deal with conflicts related to land ownership, uh, indigenous land and other challenges. So there will be a need to significantly increase uh, public and private sector funding and create efficient market mechanism. Uh, everyone is looking, to, uh, looking forward to Brazil's uh, announcements in Glasgow. And as Brazil is one of the biggest agricultural producers in the world, Individually, it's uh, the second big, largest producer after the United States. So, and, and it's also a leader in agricultural technology and productivity. So Brazil will be essential, actually, for the global effort to fight climate change. Thanks, Tatiana, for your answer. And now let me switch into Polish again. Dariusz Szymczycha, ostatnie pytanie, bo już czas dobiega końca. Chciałbym, żebyśmy zakończyli za chwilę nasz panel z jakąś kropką nad i też. So we'll need to arrive to an end of the panel, but still the Polish-Ukrainian relationships. What's the biggest challenge now? The biggest challenge? Well, we need to cooperate with the Ukrainians that are already in Poland. Notice that there is over one million Ukrainians who work in Poland, making different types of jobs, and also about 20,000 companies uh, belonging to Ukrainians. So uh, during this year, we have an increase of 5,000 of the companies. Some of them are involved in trade. Poland, to some of them, is just a stop to, uh, to the next EU countries. And we here in Poland, we should help these uh, companies, as they are the most active part of the Ukrainian uh, society and they think in the European uh, perspective too. I believe um, their, uh, their um, will to work is uh, great uh, is great to us. I will give you a, an ugly example from three years ago. Well, under the Polish-Ukrainian support, one of the foundations was trying to teach the, uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, farmers how to, uh, how to grow raspberries. The project was stopped because of the protest of the Polish producers of raspberries to the Polish government. They didn't want the competition from the Ukrainian raspberries. We should not, uh, the Polish-Ukrainian uh, cooperation should not look like that because we are natural neighbors and we have great opportunities uh, because of that. We won't, uh, we won't survive on our labor market without Ukrainians, that's modern said. It's not about labor market only, it's about having good partnership relations. Uh, they, uh, we have growing trade, and the European Union as a regulator is very comfortable also for Poland. It's easier to negotiate it with tough Ukrainian negotiators. Uh, please remember the high representative of Ukraine, Mr. Kaczka, is a tough negotiator. Thank you so much. I, Dariusz Szymczycha. Thank you for joining us today. Have a good day.